Hey, welcome to Select Arcane. I have so many blank micros and I really need to get through them. So that's what we're going to do in this video. First, I need to choose my victim. And that's not always easy because there's so many great sculpts in my collection. I'm going to go with the subscriber exclusive 2020 model, or at least half of it, Diana. She came along with a little pony named Artemis that's also jumping, but we're just going to focus on Diana for this video. Sorry, Artemis. There's a reason for this. Diana's body shape looks a lot like my stepmother's mare, Phantom. Phantom is a Clydesdale thoroughbred cross and she's about 20 years old. She's now retired, but in her heyday, she was a hunt horse, just like Diana. She used to jump, she used to go through water, and she did anything you asked her to. So in honor of Phantom, let's get started. Popping Diana out of her base, I take my diamond coated file that I got from Amazon and smooth out any rough edges or seams. Maggie is absolutely fabulous with producing horses that virtually require no prep work. But any model straight out of the mold requires a little bit of work at least. The usual problems are between the legs, under the throat, and maybe a little bit of the tail. I quickly sand her down and take her over to the sink to wash her in anti-grease dish soap and baking soda. First I apply the dish soap and make sure she's nice and clean and then I scrub her with baking soda and water in order to polish the pewter and get rid of any micro imperfections. Now, at this point after she's dry, I would usually just take her straight out to prime. But we're gonna add an extra step here and that's what makes this model a custom and not just finish work. Phantom has a very distinctive rounded Roman nose and we're gonna add that in with epoxy sculpt. First take parts A and B and squish them together using gloves. Epoxy sculpt cures via chemical reaction and that can sometimes irritate your skin, so gloves are important. After the epoxy is mixed, I take a very small sample of the epoxy and use my color shaper tools to squish it into her face. Sometimes this takes a little bit of convincing and I use a little bit of water to convince the clay to stick. Using my fingers and the tools, I shape it into the way I want and create an almost seamless customization. Epoxy takes two hours to cure, but before we start priming and adding more chemicals on top, I'm just going to wait 24 hours at least. I leave her overnight to dry, and the next day I take her out to prime. What's this? Yes, the studio is under renovation. I'm using brown Duplicolor Sandable Primer and I give her a very thin base coat of primer. This stuff works great for small scale models, especially pewters, because it's an auto paint. So it sticks very, very well. Back inside the drying cupboard and I leave her to dry again. Usually I would be wearing gloves while handling a pony right after being primed but I know for a fact that she's gonna have to be sanded again. And that's what we're gonna do. The Duplicolor Sandable Primer makes it so much easier to see the imperfections and make it so much easier to know where to sand. I can already see that my modification is very close, but just needs a little bit of sanding to blend right into her face, as well as there's a few sharp ridges. And there's some extra seams between her legs, ears, and belly that I knew would show up if I primed. Using my diamond coated file, I very carefully go around those areas that are still pewter and I'm using a low grit sanding sponge to go over the epoxy modification. I do use my diamond coated file at first on her nose, but then I switch the sanding sponge to hide any scratches that the file would create. Thank you. 
Eh, she looks a little bit rough, but this is the part of the process that you have to trust. Next, it's back to the sink for another anti-grease dish soap bath, but this time I'm not going to use baking soda because it will scratch the primer. After placing Diana back on the drying shelf for another 24 hours, I took her out to spray, and very soon she will transform into Phantom. Before we begin layer one, let me show you what I use as a palette for my oil paints. I just fold up a piece of regular old tin foil and add my paints directly to that tin foil palette. And I also add in a drop of linseed oil on the side and use a palette knife to mix my paints. I don't use a brush to mix the paint because otherwise the brush will take up half the paint, will leave brush strokes on the horse after you apply it because the paint will be too thick. Using the palette knife does not waste paint. I just use as much oil as I need until the paint is buttery smooth and no longer thick, and I mix my desired colors. I'm using a mix of burnt umber and black with the intent to darken her up a little bit. Now, there are consequences of using red primer for this model and then using burnt umber. Burnt umber, as you might recall from high school art, is on the red scale, meaning that when you apply burnt umber onto the model, she's going to become very red. And I'm doing this on purpose for a reason. First, to show and demonstrate how that works. And then secondly, how to correct it. Normally, I wouldn't use this combination for the first layer, but it's okay, trust the process. After applying very thin layers onto Diana, you can see that she's become a very dark red, like too red for even a chestnut horse. But it's okay, we're gonna tone this down. For layer two, again, if you remember from high school art class, raw umber, not to be confused with burnt umber, is on the green color scale. And if you look at the color wheel, green and red are on opposite sides and therefore cancel each other out. You may have seen some recent TikTok videos about hair dyeing, for example, how if you have red hair, you can cancel it with green toner and go back to a more natural color. It's exactly the same concept. It's all called color theory. So when you use raw umber on top of this red, you hit more of a brown tone and cancel the red out. See, isn't she looking so much closer to what Phantom actually looks like already? There's no shading or highlights. This is just the base coat. Once the oils are dry, you can see that the color is a lot darker now. For layer three, I just go in with the same combination of raw umber and black to tone down the red even further. Phantom doesn't have a red tone at all to her color, so we're going to cut that out completely. I also go in with some straight ivory black to start blocking in the darker areas of her body. At this time, her legs and face don't really matter because those will have white markings. Wow, after layer three, we're really close already. So in layer four, we're gonna add the low lights or anywhere direct light is not going to hit her, like the shadows. We're gonna take another color theory trick and create black without using black. This will create more depth and illusion of color. We're gonna mix ultramarine blue with burnt umber to create a false black. I mix that with a bit of linseed oil and apply to the darker areas of her body. Traditionally, horses have a darker top line, so along the withers, back, and bum. And then anywhere where there's shadows, the armpits, the haunches, the creases of her neck, anything like that. And I'm completely ignoring her face and cannon bones because of the white markings. I try not to mix this into any area of her body that will have highlights, which will come later. If we do highlights now with the low lights, she's so small that when you're blending it all together, it'll get muddy and won't look very finished. We've reached layer five, which is going to be the absolute last oil layer. Woohoo! This time we're going to be doing a few separate things. I'm using this reference image of Phantom specifically, and you can see that there's a lot of blue tinting. And in the model, there's no blue at all. So what I'm doing is I'm mixing Payne's Gray, which has a blue base, 
with white and linseed oil. And I'm filling in the highlight areas like the barrel, the bum, parts of the neck, anywhere where a highlight would hit. And I'm adding a little bit of that mixture there. Blending it out, it creates an almost grayish blue hue. It's not very noticeable in shade, but you can really see it under light. This adds depth and definition. Next, I'm going in a completely different direction where I'm adding yellow ochre and white with a little bit of linseed oil, and that's gonna create a light beige. Phantom is a little unusual where she has these beige ears, and I'm not entirely sure why, even though she's classified as a black horse, but we're adding a little bit of that for not only the ears, but also a few key areas like the flanks. Again, this adds depth and definition. And finally, we're going back in with the ultramarine blue and burnt umber to create that false blue. And we're going back along the top line to really finalize the shading. And that's it. That's all we're gonna do for oils. I give her a few days on the drying rack specifically because oils take a long time to dry in general, but you want to make sure they're extra, extra, extra cured before you add in your sealant. Otherwise you can mess up all the work you just did. I'm using Tester's Delco to seal in because it's a little bit more forgiving with my humidity in this area. And then I put her back on the drying rack after giving her a spray. I just want to point out that the only reason I'm spraying in this room is because there's no windows and only screens. So it's quite safe to spray and there's full flow through. My studio also looks right into this room and when it's all done, it'll look a lot more seamless. Once Phantom's dry, I pull out my Prismacolor pencils. Here I'm blocking in the markings that she has all over her body. She has a big white face, she has stockings, and she has some Sabino markings going on. And it can get a little bit tricky to freehand it with just acrylic paint, so I'm going in with the pencil ahead of time because you can erase any of your mistakes. Following my references off screen, I trace her markings with the pencil. Any mistakes can be rubbed out with your finger and tried again. All of this is gonna be hidden under the paint anyways. Next, I pull up my acrylic paint. For so many years, I had found white markings to be the bane of my existence and so hard to do, especially on such a tiny scale. In my Clydesdale Micro Mix Media video, I actually go into full detail how I had obtained perfect white markings. And I'm gonna link this right here, right now, just in case you want more detail. But essentially, I'm mixing white and Titan Buff, and I'm using Golden Brand Acrylics, and I water them down until they're cons the consistency of milk. Test the consistency out on your hand. If the paint beads up on your hand, there's too much water. And if it feels thick, like cream or sour cream, then it's definitely too much paint. Check the other video for more details and to go further into depth. I'm not using gouache in this case for a simple reason. It's not all that durable, and I'm worried that it's going to chip off over time, especially because this model has to be pulled in and out of its base all the time. So I'm just going to go with the safer option and use acrylics. I start filling in those blocked out markings with, with the paint as thinly as possible. It doesn't give much coverage, and honestly, I think this is where you're unsubscribing now because look how horrible this looks. But trust me and trust the process that this is just layer one. Slowly, very, very slowly build up your layers using the same milky paint as before. And it will eventually build and become extremely opaque. Do the same with the legs, the same with the belly spots. And eventually after 40 minutes, I'm not kidding you, this took me 40 minutes while watching anime that I have achieved this level of coverage. I did not change the consistency of the paint at all or rush anything. As you can see, I also blocked in the muzzle, which is definitely supposed to be pink. And yeah, that's because it lays a nice foundation for the actual peach paint. I mix yellow, red, Titan buff, white, and a little bit of burnt umber acrylic paint and get a nice skin tone peach color. I block that into the muzzle using the same milk consistency and blend it into the white. 
I used that color, mixing more Titan Buff to make it much more pale to create the shell hoof color. Phantom has all pink feet, and that's not the same color as her muzzle. They're a bit more yellow. I block those in as well. Again, using the milky paint. And there, she's all blocked in and ready for her next step, which are her tiny, tiny, tiny bicolored eyes. Phantom has one blue eye and one brown and blue eye. Following her references extremely carefully, I block them in using my tiniest brush. And by the way, I got these little nail art brushes off of Amazon and I highly recommend them. Very carefully, I use the thinnest brush to block in her eyes. And I use black for the pupils. Her eyes are so tiny you can't even shade them, so I'm not really bothering. But I do make her little pink tear ducts with that same peach pink. While Phantom dries, I start blocking in her base that's been completely neglected up to this point. I'm just blocking it into acrylics, putting a grass base, stone wall, and a little log on top. Nothing fancy. After blocking in the base color of the wall, I dry brush some lighter paint over the wall to create a more stone texture. Trust me, there's a reason why this is so basic and boring, and we're going to get to that point. But first, let's seal her. Because without sealing her, this happens. Acrylic paint will just peel right off the base. There's nothing really holding it on. So sealing in two coats of Del Coat, I go in with the first coat, let her dry for 20 minutes, going in with the second coat and let her dry for another 20 minutes. This promises a nice even seal and her coat will be nice and durable in case she gets dropped. So Phantom is technically done, except for one last thing, but now we're gonna completely move over to her base. Firstly, I'm gonna repair this area right here. The paint just isn't sticking to the pewter base and even the primer is starting to wear thin. Hunt horses only work during the spring and fall seasons. In the summer, it gets too hot for hounds to pick up the scent, and that's why it's relegated to those two separate seasons. But that doesn't mean that hunt horses don't work during the summer as well. We're gonna go with a fall theme for Phantom here, because after all, this is a fall video, isn't it? Using some black and burnt umber, I fill in the places right before and after the jump, and I'll show you why in a minute and then use Liquitex high gloss varnish all over the entire base. This provides a very shiny but durable finish. And then I go out again with dull coat just to spray over and mat it back down. This is the part that really brings the sculpture to life. I'm going to use gamer's grass in the smallest size I can possibly find. In the fall, there's a lot of crab grass and the leaves start turning, so we're specifically going to clump everything together and add a lot of fall colors. Using Tough Tack glue, I add a dollop of glue in place with a toothpick and very carefully peel off the grass from the sticker paper. That's right, these clumps of grasses are actually stickers and I have two different colors and that will just add a little bit of color and a bit more realism. I stack them mostly around the base of the jump, making sure to not create a pattern. I also add some red flowers to kind of give it a pop. And it's kind of like a burning bush, but I really wish I had yellow to create some goldenrod. Alas, don't have that luxury right now. I stick some grass directly into the mud, as though the horses have already gone through and left a little bit of space behind where they haven't trotted all the way through. This also hides the hole beside her foot. Next, I add glue to where the grass is already blocked out with the paint. And I get my Static King. This is what I use to create static grass that actually stands up, like individual grass blades. 
using the machine, I just very gently tip it over and shake some grass out. And it falls standing up, which adds considerably more realism. I'm also using the smallest setting. And as you can see, there's a lot of grass. Don't worry, just shake it off. And I add one more flower on the side. Now this goes on the drying rack for 24 hours and I turn my attention back over to Phantom where I use my Prismacolor pencils to outline her hooves and add a bit of depth. I'm just scratching along horizontally and vertically with brown and white and I seal her one final time. Glossing her eyes and nostrils and just waiting for the base to dry, Phantom's done. I was finally able to finish this girl up over Labor Day weekend. I've been quite busy and it's been hard to find time to finish her off, so there's been lots of breaks in between. If you condensed all the time without drying time, she would have taken about seven hours to complete. Phantom's permanent companion is Lola, an off-the-track thoroughbred. She also was a hunt horse in her heyday, and it just so happens that I've already painted her ages ago as a micro. Now they can be also together on my shelf. I think without realizing it, I've already done this project, but just in mixed media with my Clydesdale family. And I seem to have this affinity towards black horses because the last micro I completed was Fuji. Uh, oops. I think next time I'll specifically choose a micro not to be black just so I can show you I can do another color. Oops. The real Phantom now lives about two and a half hours away and I won't be visiting her until Thanksgiving, but I did request some new footage of her. So this is the best I can do. I'd love to know what you think of her. And if you like this video, please like and subscribe. You can follow me on Instagram at select arcane and on Facebook by the same name. Thanks again. Bye.